Side and infer a fungicide trial. Uh, there's a lot been done sort of in the press over the last few years uh, on farm. Um, various companies have been pushing it, a lot of information out there looking at infer uh, fungicide treatments in conjunction with nematicides. Um, in this instance, it's nematorin, but also um, mocha and, uh, and viadate have been used in various trials as well. And I know Matt will want to comment on that in a little while from what he's seen and work that he's doing. Of course when we're talking about nematicides we're not just talking about uh, controlling PCN, we're looking at free living nematodes. Uh, we have done some counts on free living nematodes on this site uh, and we're looking at uh, numbers of around 200 Trichodorus and up to 500 uh, Pratolenchus uh, type nematodes. So those sort of numbers are, are pretty high as you would expect from um, uh, uh, soil and, and, and land that's been well potatoed in the past um, as is Castle Howard Estate Andrew I mean there's been numerous uh, numerous crops of potatoes on, 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 on this on this field as well as um, uh, generally on the estate so we're looking at different uh, uh, in for treatments now uh, why Amistar um, well we're looking at Amistar in this situation because um, we're looking at rhizotonia control mainly Amistar has uh, a couple of things on its label really. One is black dot, uh, for the control of black dot. Now you might use uh, Amistar at three litres in furrow for, the control, for controlling black dot in, in, in a packing situation because it's mainly, black dot is a mainly a, um, a problem in packing crops. Um, whereas we're just purely looking for rhizotonia control, looking at tuber numbers, uh, trying to maintain tuber numbers, uh, stopping stolon pruning and all that sort of thing. Um, and you might argue, well, won't Monstrin do that, or won't Rhino do that, won't Rhizolex do that? Well, those sort of treatments, they're seed treatments, and they only work on the, so the seed-borne phase of Rhizotonia or, or Black Scurf. So, Kate no doubt washes your seed when it, when it arrives on farm, and if there's any Black Scurf on it, then, of course, you, you'll treat it with Monstrin or something like that. However, if there isn't any Black Scurf on it, do you still treat it? Is it worth treating? Probably not, because if there's nothing on the seed and you still get rhizotonia issues, it's going to be coming from the soil. So you ought to maybe be spending your money, or considering spending your money on, on controlling the soil-borne rhizotonia rather than seed-borne if you haven't got any on the seed. But do you not get better tuber um, balance with using um, what do you call my it? Argument, my argument, no, I don't think so personally, because my argument would be what is the mechanism in, 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 in control in, or, or managing that tuber number? Well, yes, it's controlling, controlling stem canker and stolon pruning, but the rhizotonia, if there's no black scurf on the seed, isn't coming from the seed, it's coming from the soil. And monstering won't have any effect on the uh, soil borne phase of rhizotonia. Have you got any comments to make on that, Matt? I mean, from work that you've done in the past? Not really, I mean obviously it's the slippery diet, isn't it? But um Rob Roll. Rob yeah. Roll essentially. Um, yeah, I, you know, there's something in it because it but it's not completely consistent, mm. I would have said. You know, whether it actually justifies the cost of, of actually doing that. It's a question I would say. So 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 what what we what we looked at here and, and mm. Andrew's standard farm practice uh, on this site is is using Amistar at a litre and a half uh, plus Nemethorin in this in this instance but on the other side that will have had a litre and a half plus Vidate down the spout. Um, so we, we know that, uh, that the, the Innovator seed here has got, uh, we're, not worried, we're not worried about black scurf on the seed so we're looking at the soilborne phase of Rhizotonia um, and obviously we know the history of the field um, and so we're looking at controlling the soil uh, phase. We've also got another product in, in here which is uh, widely available in, in Europe at the moment and uh, it's Bayer hope that it will be available in, in the UK next year. Uh, the product's called Sublime um, and that we've got that in at uh, a 3 litre rate plus and minus um, nemethorin. 
Um, free living nematodes then, uh, certainly with the numbers that we've got in here, what they, might, what they might do is actually graze on the roots and that might then cause an entry point for Rhizotoni to get in. Rhizotoni is a pretty weak pathogen, it's not particularly strong at all. And so it, it, it can casually then get in, invade, invade roots uh, on the back of other damage and that might be PCN damage and that invariably is going to be free living nematode damage. And Matt, you've been doing some work on a, on some, on a bigger scale on looking at varieties and susceptibility to uh, nematicides and to um, yeah, yeah. free livers. Yeah, I mean the whole, the whole free living nematode and rhizotoni situation this year is really quite interesting actually in that we've had absolutely ideal conditions for both of them. You know, so in the case of rhizotonia, we've had the ideal the amount of soil moisture there. We've had a huge delay in terms of emergence, you know, which and, and the slower the plant goes initially, the more the more damage it can cause. You know, so we've had everything set up for a real bad soilborne rhizotonia yeah. year. And other than where we've seen extremely free draining sand soils, we've seen very, very little effect on emergence. You know that this patchy sort of emergence you get, we haven't seen it. Um, now, in contrast to that, where we've actually done trials um, with in, in, you know infected seed this year, we've seen absolutely massive levels of stem count in the seed. Now, obviously, you haven't seen that commercially because basically the same conditions. That have meant that the soil borne rhizotonia is not there has essentially meant that there isn't a lot of <coughs> rhizotonia infection on, on the seed this year at all either. Um, but we think we're not sure quite what has happened, but what we think is that it hates waterlogging. The pathogen absolutely hates it, so that for long waterlogging period you had in the autumn, then all the way through the winter, we think it's probably just crashed inoculum levels of soil borne rhizotonia this year. Now the other interesting one is free living nematode because many people didn't test till the spring and we know that there's absolutely record levels of free living nematode present in the spring before planting. Again we've had this prolonged emergence and this real delay in you know in, in sort of 10-14 day delay in normal emergence time so it's had masses of time to actually get on top of the plant so we expect to see an awful lot of free living nematode feeding damage and again not seeing any. Not seeing any. And that one we can't that one we can't explain. And I've asked numerous researchers and they can't explain it either. So there's a lot more going on really with you know our understanding of free living nematode I mean it's bad enough with PCN populations and trying to understand that. But free living nematodes that actually you know actually move around a lot more than PCN does, it's a, it's a you know it's a minefield to say the least. Uh, undoubtedly. Now, just following on from Matt's comment, really about uh, you know free draining soils and the survival of, of rhizotoni. I have a site uh, down near Market Wheaton, uh, which is actually growing a crop of Linton, um, and the guy uh, was applying a liter and a half of Amistar across the field, and then just in the corner, right at the end of the field, he he actually ran out, and he thought, well, I can't be bothered to fill the tank up, um, I'll, so I'll just carry on planting, and. In that corner now, the crop is only just emerging. Simply, the only difference was this litre and a half of Amistad. So, you know, there is something going on there. Um, and yeah, as the rest of the crops up here, and is showing signs of rhizotonia and stolen pruning and that sort of thing, but it's emerged and grown away. Whereas the, the, the untreated uh, piece in the corner, it's, it's only just sort of like this. So, uh, um, interesting there's, again there's a lot we don't really understand about all of that as well um, in terms of uh, so we've got a number of di different treatments here uh, we've got completely untreated again this is all replicated and it, and it will be um, will be dug and results will be dis uh, disseminated through the potato council um, we haven't done any digs today because really we want to take it right through to the, to the death um, I think what uh, what we saw well what you saw particularly last year was it like a, a checkerboard effect of, yeah, yeah, uh, of yeah. from various different treatments? Yeah, well, we've we done one or two little test digs in here, haven't we? And, we, you know, that, and there are some trends showing up in this trial that we've, I've seen in research before. And the first one is that the biggest effect that your nematicide is having is on tuber number, hmm. particularly with free living nematode. We consistently see that 
that an ematicide is increasing tumor number. Now, whether or not that actually turns into a yield advantage depends on how long that crop grows for. And the variety, doesn't it? And the variety. You know, so, you know, we do, you know, we do trials in Scotland where we'd stop it 100 days. Sometimes we actually see an untreated yielding more than where we've actually applied an ematicide. But if you then take that on to the full maturity, you then see a reverse of that situation. The second thing that comes through is that we consistently see that Amistar tends to increase the size and uniformity of the tubers. But we don't always see a yield response from either a nematicide on its own or just Amistar or, or, the, or any, or sublime, you know, or, or, or sublime on its own. But what we do see is reasonably consistently we see where you combine the two, you get the benefits of the tuber number and a, an interaction going on there, you know, with, with, with the fungicide that's enabling the crop to achieve more yield. And certainly last year I saw around about a 15% yep. increase in yield from that treatment combination where I didn't see any significant increase in yield from either Amistar alone or or the nematicide. Um, and the and other what, what, yeah, what, what, what we saw last year effect was literally we saw very little difference in the canopy until around about three weeks before and then at that stage when, when most of the plots started senescing you could see the Amistar ones just like a checkerboard. They actually stayed greener and it was those ones that stayed greener that then gave that yield response. So whether we'll see that this year, we don't know, or whether it was well, just an extreme. There, there are one or two stage. things just yeah. starting to appear in this now. There are one or two differences yeah. in some of the plots now. They're going to turn in a bit paler, Definitely. a bit more phosphate deficiency appearing, and, yeah. and that sort of thing. And then, of course, the, the other thing that um, uh, has been widely sort of publicised again uh, over the last few years is is uh, a link, a possible link between uh, the use of nematicides in this way. Uh, and 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 uh, Amistar with fry colour. Well, in in your work, Matt, that doesn't really follow. Is that what you're finding? Um, well, to, to to date, in terms of our trials, like that, that the jury is still out on yeah. that one. We've, we've not certainly not seen a consistent response. No. It might work one year, but then in another year it might not. So uh, that's just something to be something to be mindful, I guess. Um, in terms of emergence, just on the, on the, on the, on the chart here, um, this is all on the uh, percent on the 3rd of, 3rd of June. Again, the untreated emerged pretty quickly, but that's the effect then, I guess, of soil treatments, soil treatments and uh, any soil treatment, be, be it Monstrin or, or be it Amistar in furrow, Sublime in furrow, it actually delays, delays emergence by a day or two, maybe a little longer in some seasons. Um, but then by, you know, within, within seven days, everything had pretty much emerged uh, and was growing away pretty, pretty evenly. Uh, the three litre nemethorin rate, obviously, that, whether the nemethorin was having an effect on free living uh, and root development and allowed that to get away a bit quicker, uh, unsure of really, we'll know a bit more when we, when we do our digs and just see what, what's going on. Um, but generally there was very little to, to read between all of them by, by, by mid July in terms of um, canopy development. Um, how long they all last for uh, now in, into, the, into the back end of the season. I guess this crop's got another two, maybe three at best weeks to run Thereabouts, and yeah. then you'll be burning it off but uh, I think we'll, we'll just have to, we'll just have to see.